Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to receive the blessing of coming here. I always love coming here. Uh, Abuna David and uh, Abuna Dinesh always welcome me with uh, open arms, so it's nice to, to be here. Um, I wanted to focus on something we say during Kiev, actually. Um, in the, one of the Theotokayas, I think it's the Friday Theotokaya, we say, he took what is ours and gave us what is his. And so we see this kind of exchange. He took what is ours and gave us what is his. Um, and so I kind of want to start with that, and then I want to digress for a second, for a long second, um, and ask you all a question, which is, if I were to ask you what's your biggest problem, what would your answer be? And if you think about all our problems, we have lots of problems, health problems, parent problems, kid problems, school problems, work problems, service problems. But when we think about our problems, the biggest problem we all have is we're going to die. And that's your biggest problem. And that's the one that we all kind of think about. And sometimes it can cause a lot of discouragement for some people. Um, in fact, there's a whole train of thought, a whole school of philosophy called nihilism. And basically, it kind of focuses on everything is meaningless. And when you think about it, it's all meaningless. And the premise is there's this pervasiveness, this pointless pervasiveness to life. I'll read you some quotes. It starts off with the point is there ain't no point. The purpose, there is no purpose to life. You are here to achieve nothing. Whatever you feel is your supreme goal in life is a fiction created by you and your society you are living in, just to keep yourself busy in this purposeless creation. You are born to die. Everything else is pure nonsense. So this kind of thinking commonly torments people here in the West, and it leads people to ask questions about the meaning of the world, and we've been debating these questions for centuries and thousands of years. What's the meaning of life? What's the purpose if we're all going to die? It started with Greek philosophy and Plato, and it just never has ended. And of course, there's no scientific proof or evidence on this in any direction. I mean, we, can't, we can't prove anything. Um, and so with God's grace today, let's kind of talk about this topic of death. And of course, the real topic I want to, we all want to think about isn't death. It's about what happens after death. And that's the part that we can not observe with any kind of proof. Um, and you can imagine Death evokes kind of a, makes you think about a lot of things. I'm sure some of you have been at the side of someone who, who passed away in a hospital bed. And I even imagine the people that wrapped, the women that wrapped Jesus as they were wrapping him. I mean, Jesus was dead, dead, dead. And they wrapped him and they thought to themselves, really, this is it? After he raised people from the dead, walked on water, did all these things, this is how it ends. And I'm sure it made them question a lot of things. And ultimately, this question of death has, has, to, has, has created um, lots of people to try to give answers. Right? So let's kind of think about the answers, because the answers have gone into two different camps. And so I'll talk about the two different camps. The first one I'll call the the ancient religious view. And I'm going to use the word religious in quotes because it's not Christianity. So this, this view applies to Hinduism, Buddhism, Greek philosophy, Plato, Aristotle, all of these religions that try to explain death. And what it does is it defends this other world view. It says, well, the world on earth here, this is, you know, this is really bad, but the world that's coming, that's the good, that's the good one. And it belittles this world that we're in that it's meaningless, it's evil, and the only time you end the meaninglessness and the evilness is when you go to the next world. So that's kind of this religious explanation that's out there. And then there's a secular view, the atheist view, which defends this world. In the name of the now, it rejects any possibility of eternity. There is no eternity, and in fact, it reduces man to a de facto accident, transitory, temporal occurrence that just happened to happen and we're just in it. And so the question is, as a Christian, do I have to accept one of these two? Or can I accept both? And why does it matter? Well, it turns out it's important what your view on death is. Because what your view on death is affects what your view on life is and how you live your life. It's called my worldview, and it affects everything, and it permeates every part of my personality and any part of my outlook. And for some of us, 
because of our relationship to death isn't healthy, death is horrible. It's very fearsome. And there are people who are very, very scared of death. And there are people who don't go to funerals. There are people who don't want to talk about it. And there's, you know, there's, there's people we saw during COVID who just kind of lost it, right? That scared, that scared to get sick, that scared to die. And their views are very harsh on death. And you don't, and you don't want to, you know, when their parents talk about it, I don't, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to deal with it. I can't deal with it. And so which is it? Should I take the secular view about the world now? Do I have to accept that view? Or do I accept this ancient religious view that it isn't about this world, it's about the next world, right? And, and which camp do I, do I take? And it turns out that I don't have to accept either one. The Christian faith actually gives us a different answer. It gives us this third answer. St. Paul basically says, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? So this is what St. Paul says in Corinthians. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So the Christian answer is the annihilation of death, the destruction of death. As we say in the hymns of the church, trampling down death. And so in the final analysis, kind of this religious perspective or the secular perspective, neither one's really Christian, and both are unsatisfying in different ways. And neither one of us gives us a real answer. So let's kind of delve into the the two. The first one is the ancient religious view. And again, I keep calling it religious in quotes because it's not really Christian. Because here it's sort of a rejection of life in the name of death. And the focus is on death. And the thinking goes that death is inevitable. We're all going to die. Then it's best to transfer all our hopes and all our aspirations to this other mystical world. And so life itself is just seen as a means of preparing for death. But that's kind of unsatisfactory to young people, especially here in the West, right? Because it's so focused on this other world. That air conditioning is very loud. It's so focused on this other world that I know nothing about, that I can't perceive, that no one really knows anything about. So every time you talk to me about it, you say, you just got to wait 70 or 80 years. And then this other world is waiting for you. And I'm 15 and I think to myself, that's a really long time. And how can I, the object of my desire be something that I know so very little about? But this view helps people deal with death. And this religious perspective sometimes is offered as a way to help us cope with death, make it even desirable. Say, you know, death is this liberation from the oppressiveness of the body. Death is liberation from suffering. Death is liberation from disease and, and pain. It's the beginning of eternity. And this philosophy was around in Plato's time, Buddhism, Hinduism, all of them offer the same kind of thinking. And that's because before Christ, one of the main functions of religion was to help us deal with death, to give us answers about death, to explain death to us and to reconcile us to it. And I would say that this kind of religious view is very common in Egypt, where we have Islam and Christianity, and, and there's Death is sort of offered as this other world explanation to help me, be, uh, sorry, this religious view is offered as this other world explanation to help me deal with death. But of course, going to the secular view, if I'm an atheist or a secularist, it's easy to argue, did God really create this world and all of its beauty and all of its possibilities just for man to reject all of it and forego all of its glorious possibilities in the name of this future thing that I don't know very much about. So the atheist here in the West especially is going to argue, you know, that let's focus on this life. Like, let's not think about the afterlife. I will reject religion in the name of this world and this life and what I can see and what I can touch now. And this is the view that many of our youth now have and many that we encounter at work and in school. And this secular view, of course, is secular view, of course, is still Death is still scary and imminent. And because in a secular view, I've lost my perspective of eternity, man becomes even more fragile and more fearful because the only life I have is this one. In fact, when you go to even a secular funeral, you know, you hire a funeral director, right? And this guy, he tries to make everything pleasant, right? In fact, you know, he tries to take away any sadness out of the experience and make it into a semi-pleasant experience. In fact, the corpse is beautified, right? We put makeup and we do plastic surgery on the face so that it disguises its deadness. 
right? So it's almost like this weird silence concerning death. And sometimes we'll even call it a celebration of life because there's this awkwardness about death. I just don't want to talk about it. And so because the secularist only thinks about this world and this life, then my goal as a man is just to make this life and this world as meaningful and as rich and as happy as possible, right? And, you know, the young people say YOLO, right? You only live once. Just You go for it. You do everything you can, every experience, everything you can shove into this life, you go for it. And life ends with death. It's unpleasant, but it's natural. And so the best thing I can do as a, sec a secular thinking is simply to accept it as something natural. So what do I do? How do I deal with this as an atheist? Well, I don't think about death. I live as though I'm not going to die, as if death doesn't exist. And the best way to get through it is to be busy, to be useful, dedicate yourself to great and noble things, something that will outlive your own life. This is the kind of thing that an atheist does. You know, Think about a foundation or a cause or something that's going to outlive me. Build a better world. And then if by some weird coincidence there is a God and it happens to exist, and he wants to reward me for my busy, useful, meaningful life. And that's even you know, a cherry on top, right? And that's sort of how the secular person deals with the issue of death. And that's very common here in the West. That's more pervasive than what we have in Egypt. All right, so we've talked about the religious view, right, which deals with the life after death. And then we've talked about the secular view, which deals with this life. And it's like the secular world rejects death. And the religious view rejects life. So now let's discuss the Christian view of death. And so in Christ, death isn't so easily reduced to one of these two perspectives. St. Paul said the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So it's as if we find ourselves in this third dimension. Death is an enemy that must be destroyed. So let's think about Christ's reaction to death. There was once when he went to a a grave, right? Lazarus. And how did he handle being at Lazarus's tomb? What did he do? He just cried. He wept. And that's a very powerful witness because he didn't do all the things we do at funerals, right? He could have consoled the family. He could have said, you know, it's okay. Lazarus is in heaven. It's all good. He ended his suffering. He's, he's happier now. He could have said all the things that we say at funerals that we try to say to each other to try to mitigate the situation, but he didn't. He just cried. And then according to the gospel, he raises Lazarus from the dead. And so Christ never really talks so much about the immortality of souls that we hear a lot about. He talks about the resurrection of the dead, and he focuses on that. And there's a difference. Christ said, the dead shall rise and those in the graves shall rejoice. So in essence, Christianity isn't coming, isn't about coming to terms with death. It's about victory over death, not dealing with it. And so Christ wept at the, friend, the grave of his friend Lazarus. And we need to pause and think about the meaning of those tears for a moment. Because it's a transformation. Because Christ struggled with death. It doesn't seem like a normal and natural thing. It appears as something foreign. It's unnatural as fearsome and perverted, and it's acknowledged as an enemy by St. Paul, right? And in fact, this is our reaction at funerals. We cry at funerals too. Why? Why do we cry? Because death isn't natural. It wasn't supposed to be like this. It's not really part of the plan. And although intellectually, I know everything dies biologically, animals die, we die, plants die, everything dies, it still doesn't feel like it should happen. And when it happens, it still shocks us. I was just with someone today whose dog died. Dog was 16 years old and he cried like a baby. It just doesn't feel right. And in fact, when you see someone who's being very stoic at a wedding and pretending like everything's fine, especially when someone close to them has died, it's very appropriate to remind them it's okay to grieve. It's okay to cry. Christ did. You have to let it out because it doesn't feel right. It doesn't, you shouldn't just say, oh, it's natural, everyone dies, it's fine. No, you wouldn't be a human being to have that reaction. And so the, the question we, we face as Christians is, where does death come from? Where did, where did death get invented? <laughs> That's a good answer. 
And the answer is not from God. Death didn't come from God. In the Book of Wisdom, there's this beautiful verse that says, this brief statement, it says, God did not make death, and he does not delight in the death of the living, for he created all things that they might exist. And so the first mention we see of death is in the garden. God said, don't eat of this, this tree, or else death you shall surely die. And by the way, he didn't say, I'll kill you. He said, death you shall die if you choose from this tree. That means in the world, there's in creation, there's this power, this thing that didn't come from God. He didn't create and it opposes him. It's different to him. Everywhere in the gospel, God is called life, the giver of life. Ma'atil hayat. Right? He's never, 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 death is never talked about in char- as a characteristic of him. So if death didn't come from God, where did it come from? In, in Romans, St. Paul tells us, and through sin, death has come into the world. And in fact, we say the same thing in the liturgy, don't we? In the prayer of reconciliation, death entered the world through the envy of the devil. So death is this foreign thing that came into the world. It's kind of not supposed to be part of the plan. It came into the world as a spiritual catastrophe. It isn't natural. It's not part of the plan. It's a foreign enemy that came into the world. And so Christianity tells us that death isn't some mystery to be solved or something to be explained. It's an enemy to be destroyed. And that's exactly what Christ does. He comes and he conquers that enemy. In the Apostles' Creed, it says, I believe in the resurrection of the body. And in the Creed, we say currently, we say we look for the resurrection of the dead. This is what we constantly affirm. And so Christ became sin, and he took on death in order to alleviate death from us. And on Easter, we're going to sing Christos Anisti, Christ is risen. By death, he trampled death, and in the tombs, bestowing life. In fact, this is what Christ does. What happened as soon as Christ died? on the cross. Who remembers? The gospels say the tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had were dead were raised to life. So as soon as he died, people just started coming alive, which is really a freaky scene. Right? Kind of reminds me of the zombies, right? They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. This is the reaction of death to life. And so both ancient religions and secular atheists, by explaining death, they give it a status and they give it a rationale. They call it normal. And only Christianity proclaims it to be abnormal and truly horrible. At the grave, Jesus wept. And when his own hour approached, he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. Death isn't part of the plan. And so the secular world tells us we want freedom, we want prosperity, we want to be well fed. But what's the use of all of these things, freedom, prosperity, and food, to one who's condemned to die? What's the point? Are you even going to enjoy it? Can you imagine if someone came in and said, I'm going to kill you in 10 minutes. What's your favorite meal? I want you to enjoy your last meal. Well, you know what? I'm probably not going to enjoy it, right? Knowing this thing is looming over my head, can I enjoy any of life? Right? And I have to resort into one of these, these worlds where I just try to get as much out of life as I can, or I simply dismiss life altogether and say it's just a matter of the other life that I'm focused on. And so Christianity answers and says, man desires life, not for a moment, but for eternity. Man doesn't want to die. And that's the fight or flight response that all of us have. So the point of Christianity isn't sitting around and waiting to die. Life isn't just a lead up to death. Christ tells us, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So there's no more loneliness. There's no more fear. There's no more darkness. Christ says, I am with you now and always in complete knowledge, complete love, and complete power. Christ makes life bearable. So as we go through a holy week and we think about everything we're seeing here, thine is the power and the glory and the blessing and the majesty You know, when we think about this icon of Christ crucified and the pictures of Christ crucified, and if someone came in off the street and saw us talking or or praying to a crucified Christ and saying, thine is the power and the glory, wouldn't they think we're off our rockers? 
doesn't make much sense. But we know what his death is doing. We know his death is conquering death. And so how do I participate in this conquering of death that Christ gave us, that we're going to participate with on, on Friday and on Easter? Again, let's go back to the story of the creation. What did Adam and Eve do wrong? Well, the first thing is they chose, you know, I don't know, you know the answer. The first thing they did is they chose the fruit that God didn't bless. I'll say it another way. They chose not God. They chose to detach themselves from God and not obey his commandments. As we say in the Gregorian liturgy, I plucked for myself the sentence of death. And St. Augustine tells us beautifully, you have created for us yourself, Lord, and our hearts cannot rest until they find rest in you. So that's the tragedy of the story of creation is they chose not God. And life becomes meaningless when it's without, when it's cut off from God, when it's cut off from beauty. And we even see this in a flower, right? We all know how a flower works. You can cut it and it'll live for a little bit, but you know it's dying. And you know it's just a matter of time, right? And when you cut a branch off from the tree, you know it's just a matter of time before it dies. Anything cut off from life is dead. So the first thing they did is they chose not God. But that's okay. I do that all the time. I did that today. Right? Many times we choose not God. Now what did they do? Well, they were naked, they were ashamed, and they wanted to clothe themselves. So what did they do? They sewed some fig leaves together and they covered themselves. What's wrong with that? Well, they wanted to fix it. They had a problem and they wanted to fix it. It seemed like a good idea. Fig leaves are nice and big. An animal skin. He had an animal sacrifice. He basically said, I will cover your sins. You don't cover your own sins. I take care of that. And this sacrifice was a prefigurement to his sacrifice on the cross on Friday. And so who clothes, who clothed them? God clothes them. Who covers them? God covered them with their own sacrifice. Today, over and over, we read about the, the tree, the, the fig tree that Christ cursed, how it had leaves but no fruit. And sometimes those same big fig leaves are the ones we use to cover ourselves. The fathers of the church teach us that the fig leaves in the, um, in the, in the, in the, in the story of the, of the cursed tree, those trees, those, those fig leaves are acts we can do. They're ascetic acts, they're the sacraments, and they look really good, but they're not an end in of themselves. They have to bear fruit. And sometimes I want to cover myself, so I do more acts. I do more fasts. I do more prayers. I do more vigils. I attend more liturgies. I do more things. But Christ says, that's not how you cover your sin. I cover your sin. I do it. So let's get back. To, let's get to our final point. You ever hear the expression, you are what you eat? Man is what he eats. And so what do we eat? What did Adam eat? He ate death. What do we eat? Death. We eat dead animals, dead fruits and vegetables, and we think it's totally normal. But everything we're eating is in the process of rotting, isn't it? And so we have to get it, we have to get to it early, right? It's you know, you gotta put it in the fridge, you gotta put something on it, you gotta you can't just leave it because it's rotting. It's because it's dead, it's been plucked. And so this is what we're doing. We're hungry and we're trying to fill ourselves. And what do we fill ourselves with? Death. And so Christ comes along and says, don't do that. Don't fill yourself with death. Fill it with life. And in fact, this is exactly what Jesus said to the Pharisees. Didn't he? he said, your fathers, what, ate men in the wilderness and are dead. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, I will raise on the last day. Again, the concept of resurrection. I was watching a movie, and this father and their son, father and son were stranded in this desert, and they had no food, and they had like one little piece of food left, and help was not coming. And so the son told his dad, the son, uh, the, sorry, the father told his son, I want you to eat this, right? Eat it so that you can live. 
All right, I want you to have life in you. And I look at the story of the Last Supper, and I think it's the same story. Christ gives this to them and says, eat this so you can live. This thing will give you life. This thing is me, and I am life. Don't eat death. Don't choose the meaninglessness of the world. And that's ultimately what the Eucharist is, right? When we think about the Eucharist and Abuna praying on the, the, the bread, and he, we transform it into the body of Christ. So when Abuna is done with the liturgy, how many bodies of Christ do we have? This is uh, class participation time. How many bodies of Christ do we have? One body of Christ. And then Abuna takes the body of Christ and he breaks it up into 100 pieces. How many bodies of Christ do we have? Same one. And now he puts the 100 pieces in the mouth of everyone in the church. How many bodies of Christ do we have? One. But now he is in us and we are in him. We have eaten life. And this is the promise that he made in John chapter 6. The Eucharist is participating in this risen, victorious Christ. Again, let's go back to the beginning. Take what is ours and giving, give us what is his. So we say he took what is ours. What did he take that's ours? He took death. And then he gave us what is his. What is his? Not just life. He took death and he gave us death conquered. So he took our death and he conquered it for us and he gave it back to us. Right? And this is ultimately what we see sometimes in, the, in some churches. You'll find next to the, the icon of the crucifixion, you'll see an icon of David and Goliath. Now, why would you put David and Goliath next to the crucifixion? Well, you think about David. David is, you know, we just said yesterday, Hosanna to the son of David, right? David's a symbol of Christ. And he goes up against Goliath. Who's Goliath? What's Goliath? He's a giant. He's the undefeatable foe, correct? He's never been defeated. Nobody can beat Goliath. So who's our undefeatable foe? Who's the enemy that cannot be defeated? Death. I told you, that's your biggest problem. That's the one enemy you can't defeat. And yet David goes up against the undefeatable and defeats him. And how does he defeat him? Who remembers the story? Right? He threw some rocks and he hit him on the head. Did that kill Goliath? No. That just knocked Goliath down. Then what did David do? He took Goliath's sword and he killed him with his own sword. Don't we say you trample death by death? Isn't death the weapon of the devil? And so, so Christ takes the weapon of the devil, death, and he uses it to kill death. And David used Goliath's weapon against him, his own sword, and killed him with it. And so this is what Christ came to do, to defeat death. And if you look at death and all the emotions associated with it, one of the biggest emotions is fear. There are people who are very, very fearful. And if you look at the, the Bible, on the, uh, I was reading that it says one of the most repeated commandments by God in the Bible is fear not. It's repeated 365 times apparently. I didn't count, but it's on the internet, so it has to be right. And ultimately, we see this, this transformation right in the apostles. If you look at the apostles before the crucifixion, Look at their track record. What was it like? It's pathetic, right? Nine of them fled. One of them betrays him. One of them swears and curses that he doesn't know him. And only one, John, goes to the, to the cross. After the cross and the resurrection, what's the track record? How do the apostles die? Eleven, them, eleven of them are brutally martyred. Right? They basically told him, you have to stop talking. They told the apostles, stop talking or we'll kill you. And they said, kill me. Why would they say that? Because they're not scared of death. Like, I'm not scared of death. Death has been trampled. They understood it very well. There's no fear. There's nothing you can do to me that can scare me. And so this view of death gives us a view of life. As we progress toward the cross, it changes our perspective on what life is. Life without death is a life of hope. It's full of meaning and richness and possibility. It's not futile. 
It's not without purpose. It's not, its purpose isn't just live until you die. Because that's just dread and misery. And so St. Paul comes to this exact same conclusion. In fact, we read this on the night of Easter. He says, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. That's the only logical conclusion you can come to. And in fact, the church in the Egbeya reminds us we're going to die every single night. And there's nothing to fear. Every 12th hour, the, the church reminds us that we're going to lay down to sleep and it reminds us of a mini death every single day. And that's okay. That's healthy. Because once I understand the concept of, of, of how Christ trampled death, my life has a new meaning. And as Christ said, I came so that, that people may have life and life more abundantly. I've been going too long. So Christ came and he trampled death by death. And in fact, you know, even in the, uh, the prayer of Thanksgiving, we say things like uh, tread on serpents and scorpions in every power of the enemy. If you think about a statement like that, how do you tread on a serpent? Has anyone here ever seen a snake on the ground? You ever think you could step on it? You'd be scared to death to step on it, right? You would never tread on a serpent or a scorpion because they can bite right through a shoe. They can sting right through a shoe, unless it's what? Dead, right? And so all the powers of the enemy, serpents and scorpions and all the powers of the enemy, the power of the enemy is dead. And the only way I get to tread on a snake, and I have to make sure it's really dead, is if it's dead. I don't step on live snakes. That's just not something we do. So I'll end with this, this story, and I, I don't think I'll read you the whole story because it's long, and I don't think I have to. But this person was wanted to visit an elder, a very saintly elder. And of course, he was going to come visit his elder and he was going to tell him about all these problems he had. And he was, you know, he's like, I don't want to go and complain again like I always do. And so he went into the elder's cell and before he could start complaining, he says, you know, before I tell you all this stuff that I'm going to tell you and how my wife's leaving me and how I lost my job and how all these problems are happening. I want you to know that I'm comforted, and this is him talking to the saint. He said, I'm comforted by the thought that in this earthen world in which we live, everything is empty and temporal. We need just a little bit more patient because joy and sorrow will soon pass, and the great moment will come when death will lead me into immortal life, for which I wish, unworthy as I am, to be worthy with your prayers so I can live with Christ. So what did he tell him? He basically went to the saint and said, I can't wait to die. I can't wait for God to take me and then I can go be with Christ and I can have this great life. And he said, I waited for the saint to approve what I said, to go, wow, what a great attitude you have. But the saint didn't do that. He said, kid, don't have such thoughts that you'll die and enter immortal, heavenly immortal life. Struggle to become immortal now, immortal now by dying here on earth to your bad self. So he basically said, don't wait. Immortality isn't, life with Christ isn't when you go to heaven. Life with Christ is now. We start our spiritual life now. And he looked at him with joyful surprise. So as we continue our progress toward Holy Week, I pray with all of us that we, we see Christ and his work on the cross for us, his trampling down death by death. And we realize that the Christian perspective is one of life, one of abandonment of death, no fear of death, and knowing that death is not a natural part, but something supernatural, not supernatural, abnormal, that wasn't meant to be, that entered the world through the envy of the devil. And glory be to God forever.